Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, I'm Chris Cooper. Today is all viewer questions, roses, ginkgo, and Virginia bluebells. It's the Q&A show, just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. We love your questions. Unfortunately, we can't answer all of them on air because there's just not enough time. We do answer them all and post the answers at familyplotgarden.com. We also collect them for shows like this. So, let's get started. Up first, an unknown purple plant. These purple plants keep coming up in my flower bed. Any idea what they are? And this is from Miss Sherry in Barton, Mississippi. Okay, yeah. I appreciate that. I know. And the Do you key, know what they are? Now? I know exactly. Look at you giddy over there, too. I know. I know all exactly right. what it is. Tell and, us what it is. Yeah. The key was what she said. It keeps coming, coming. up. Okay. All right. So that keyed me in that a lot of people have mistakenly think these little purple annuals that come up everywhere in their garden are the purple basil. Which is what I thought. Well, all you okay. got to do we is smell it to make right. sure, sure that it's not that. But I feel pretty sure it's a purple perilla. Perilla. Perilla, yeah, which is a can be weedy, as she attests. It mm -hmm. self sows it's all over the place, and it just makes bunches of little seeds everywhere. And it's very pretty. It's a I pretty color, so. you know. But mm -hmm. and it is used uh, medicinally by the Chinese. Oh, I'm not sure for what. Okay. But and I think in Asian cuisine, they can they use the leaves, you know, in the stir fries or as a uh, like a salad, a green, a boiled green too. Okay. So. So it's an, not, yeah, it's an annual? Yeah, it's an annual. Okay. Yeah, it's an annual. And it looks like um, ragweed, actually, to me. Mm. You know, it looks like a purple ragweed. It has the same flower, the same kind of, you know, it looks very similar. But most people think it's a purple basil, right. but okay. you can definitely know it's not that. All you got to do is smell. Just smell it. Yeah. Okay. All right, so purple perilla. Yeah, and tell her if she doesn't like it, just keep pulling it up. <laughs> you know, it'll go away eventually. Okay, and I guess what, it likes what, full sun? Oh, yeah, it yeah, it likes full, full sun. sun. It's really tenacious, too. If she Tell her if she doesn't want it seeding everywhere, just cut those seed heads off. Oh, okay. If she Good can't point. pull them up fast enough right. and they flower and set seed, be sure just when it starts flowering, cut those seed heads off. Okay. Good point. And that'll control it. All right, there yeah. you have it, Miss Sherry. All right. Purple perilla. What is this tree growing in my yard? And this is from Miss Sandra in Laos. Okay, Miss Sandra, that would be Polonia. Okay, Polonia. Some people know it's a princess tree, the empress tree. Uh, grows pretty fast. Has a real fast growth rate. Okay, uh, has the real big leaves. Right, those, some of those leaves can be like 20 inches, you know, oh, in wow. length. I mean, real big leaves. Uh, it's native to China, of course. Um, has very brittle wood though, mm. okay, once it starts to get up in age. Has beautiful flowers, kind of, the flowers kind of look like foxglove flowers. Has a fragrance, smells like uh, vanilla extract, mm -hmm. is oh, what wow. it smells like to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's pretty, but the thing about Polonia is this. It is on the Tennessee invasive list. Oh, yeah. So. Once you have it, it's taken over. Because it reproduces yeah. by seed, you know, and once it's, you know, in the ground, it, it can grow in all soil types, soil pHs, and it just takes off. Uh -huh. yeah. So it is on the invasive list here in Tennessee. So, Miss Sandra, you have a polonia, be careful with it. You know, but do know it is on the invasive list. I have a weed growing in my yard. What is oh. it? And this is from Sean. Oh. <laughs> so what is that? That weed is one of my mother's favorite plants. Uh, so, you know, being a weed is situational. Mm. This plant <laughs> is very invasive. Uh, a common name for it's uh, chameleon plant. Yes. Um, uh, the scientific name is Tetunia cordata. Mm -hmm. uh, mom used to like the name. She liked to call it hootenanny. Oh, you know, like, like nanny. the name for, <laughs> hootenanny for yeah. you know, a southern uh -huh. party, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, there's a lot of variation in the leaves. Some of them are green, mm -hmm. some of them have uh, red margins. There are actually named cultivars and all oh. this plant in the wrong place can be an invasive thug. It yes. particularly likes like part sun, uh, moist soil. It, uh, I, I saw it recently for sale in a garden store. Really? Yeah, a lot okay. of people grow them near water features and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I've seen them near ponds. 
Uh, they grow great mm -hmm. near ponds. Mm -hmm. I've got some in a wooded area of my house near the irrigation system. Okay. But yeah, once you get it, if you don't want it, it's it, it's 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 a challenge. You've wow. really got to dig it out. Right. I mean, because it you, grows by rhizomes. It, it yeah. does. It, yeah. it blooms, but I don't believe it. it uh, seeding is is necessarily a. Um, a reliable way to grow those if you want them. Right. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, I don't think it's an innovative, invasive hazard as far as outcompeting wildlife because it's limited its growing requirement. Okay. But in some states, it is considered a thug. Oh. Uh, but some, if you like mint, you know, a lot of people grow mint in containers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you, uh, the main thing is uh, uh, the sides because uh, you know the rhizomes will grow out. Yeah. If you can stop that growth out, you you you'll keep it contained. Right, and that's going to be the key. Yeah, stop that growth. I, exactly. Right. But uh, really, just yeah, just dig, dig, dig if you're trying to get it out. Wow. But it is it is pretty though. I mean, those leaves are heart shaped leaves. I like it. It's it's, it's, it's tender. It got killed back. Um, um, it, uh, this year by the by the freeze, but mm, it came yeah. it, it predictably right back up. Okay. Um, it's it's an Asian introduction. It's not yeah. native, uh, but one of the names I, uh, I did a little research found out is uh, fish smelling herb, and apparently <laughs> in Asian cuisine you can use it. So, um, you know, just see you can surprise your family with a fishy kind of off tasting herb, um, that? Uh, which actually I went out and tried after I read it, and it's. No, so, not so much, right? <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, add it to the herb garden just okay. yet. Why are my magnolia tree leaves curled? It bloomed out very pretty this spring. Now it's full of curled leaves. What can be done to reverse this problem? And this is from Carl and Olive Branch. The leaves are curled. What's the first thing you think about? Herbicides. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. yep. Phenoxy herbicides is yep. the first thing I think about. Yep. And especially when those leaves are curled downward. Yeah. They kind and, of look, yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing about the phenoxy herbicides, a lot of people use those to control broad leaf weeds yep. in their lawns and flower beds. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the problem. It could be. A couple other options. Could there okay. be drift from yeah, neighboring? True. Uh, we don't know where he lives, right. and we want to ask true. a whole series of questions sure, sure. about how close are you to agricultural fields sure. and ditch banks that may have been sprayed. But a lot of people aren't aware that a lot of times it is the lawn weed treatment. It is. It is. So that can happen because it may, may have been using the same stuff year after year, mm -hmm. but that year they may have had just a slightly stronger tank mix. It could have been that the rains happened just as they were applied and moved some of that stuff into true. the root zone. It could be in the direction of the wind when it was... Right if it were sprayed, because uh, there's just, we have to ask a bunch of questions. You have to ask a bunch of questions. And, and you know what, as it relates to wind and rain, we've had a lot of both. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Carl, I mean, could possibly be, but yeah, there's a lot of questions we need to ask. And the next question is, will it grow out of it? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, can it be reversed? No. No. <laughs> Those leaves no. will forever be distorted. Could the new growth look fine? It could. If it keeps happening every year, will the tree eventually decline and go down and possibly die? Right. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. one time it's probably, you know, there's too many factors to right. say for sure. sure, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I, yeah, it'll probably be okay. But yeah, anytime it curls downward or upward for the most part, it looks real, you know, it feels leathery, mm -hmm. looks puckered. Yes. I mean, it's the first thing that just jumps in my mind. Yes. I'd quiz the, if he has a lawn care company or if he uses it. Yeah. And you may just choose to have weeds. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. My vet did. He didn't like the injuries to his woody plants. Right. He said, I'll take weeds. You take weeds. How about that? All right, so there you have it, Mr. Carl. What is this plant that is growing in my yard? And take a look at the picture there. Uh, Stefan, what do you think about that? Oh, it looks like okra. It looks like okra to me, <laughs> right? And, and, and tell, tell us why you think it's okra, though. Because we uh, actually talked about the, this a little earlier. The purple circle uh -huh. on the center of the stem, as well as the purple veins, mm -hmm. and that's very identifiable for okra. Right. Um, I would actually just leave it alone. If you enjoy okra, let it grow. Just let it grow. It looks like it was in somebody's yard instead of in a garden, mm -hmm. you know, so maybe, you know, it came in, you know, wind, bird or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. But I would just let it go. Now, the thing about okra is this, you're going to be picking it, you know, oh, absolutely. <laughs> until frost, <laughs> you know, comes. I mean, it's going to grow pretty tall, but uh, yeah, okra plants are fine. Absolutely. Yeah, we all like okra, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I have ground ivy or creeping Charlie invading my zoysia grass. There's too much to pull up by hand. How do I kill Creeping Charlie without killing zoysia? 
or do I need to kill everything and start over? Thanks in advance, and this is from Jeff right here in Germantown. So how do I kill the Creeping Charlie without killing the Zoysia? Surely he doesn't have to kill everything, does he? Nah. <laughs> Dicamba? Dicamba would do it. Yeah, any of your three ways, you know, for the most part would do it. But let me, let's bag it for a second. So when you talk about Creeping Charlie, right, it spreads by seed and by stolons. The conditions that Creeping Charlie thrives in, excessive moisture, shade. So it means, Mr. Jeff, increase or improve your drainage, let more light into the situation. Let trees up a little bit. Huh? Yeah. yeah, let light down to that situation to oh, kind of help you out a little bit. Right. Then you can always go with the three ways, you know, dicamba, 2,4-D, yeah. you know, MCPP, you know, right. would work. Yeah, the 2,4-D doesn't do as much on uh, on ground ivy as the dicamba. Right. But I'm not sure, can you buy straight dicamba? It, Mom and garden centers, or it's always going to be. In I mix. think it's, it's pretty much in a mixture for mixed you know, for homeowners. Yeah. yeah, it's in a mixture. You know, like the, the three-way mixtures that you would have, the weed be gone and right. things like that. Be sure you follow that label direction. Read the label because I think it may have something in there about temperatures. Uh huh. You know, if it's you really exactly. hot, you probably don't need to be spraying this because uh, and, and and then wind speed, yes. and direction, and all that kind of thing. It would definitely yeah. be on a label. Yeah, follow the label direction. Right. But yeah, I always like to go back to the cultural practices first. Right. You know, so right. we improve the drainage, Start with that. get some light into the situation. That will help. And then if you want to kill it like he wants to, then you can use some of the products that we just named. Much better to treat the cause of a problem than the symptoms of a problem. You I know, would agree with you that. You treat the cause, you can change, change things. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. We really like getting viewer questions from you. This week, we are showing you some of the questions we did not get to air because of time. We continue with a question about roses. We have three knockout rose bushes that are about four years old. They started out this year looking beautiful, then the leaves started developing spots and went to what you see in the picture. We tried bare systemic rose in garden care, which is a 612-6 fertilizer with imidacloprid. We've treated the soil around them twice this year according to the directions on the label. That's good. What is this problem? And yeah, let's go back to that now. They actually follow the label of directions. That's great. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm going to jump in here first, Joel, because mm -hmm. I know what that is because I grow roses at home. Okay. Rose, slug, or soft fly. That's mm -hmm. what that is. Okay. So they eat, you know, the young tender tissue in between the veins. They look like gummy worms, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that looked like, to me, somewhere between light and moderate infestation. Mm -hmm. uh, the plant can withstand that, okay? Now, if you have heavy infestations, you know, when those leaves start to drop off, then that's a problem because it weakens the plant, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go back to what they use, contained in metacloprid. Metacloprid actually controls sawflies. Mm -hmm. You think the sawflies are dead at this point? Or when did they even treat for it? Well, so that, that's just it. When you use a systemic, you've got to give it time to get mm -hmm. up into the plant. Right. So at what point in this process did they apply it that it got into the plant enough so that the bugs that were there right. could eat it and then be affected by it? Because, yeah, they might have controlled it already. Yeah, you know. it could be that yeah. it's, but the, you know, the damage is there. Yeah, the it's damage just got to come out of the right. damage that's there. Yeah, the damage yeah. is done when it's very, 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 very small. Very small. Right. So very it's small. just going to grow and it'll show. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the damage is already done. The, the fertilizer, you know, in this product should help, you mm -hmm. know, the plant recoup. Uh, but again, imidacloprid is something you can use to control soft flies. You can go with the oils. There's a horticultural oil, a neem oil, insecticidal soap. Uh, you can use, and all of those are nice, good, green, organic products. Yes. Right. So I would go with those. Uh, but yeah, here again, we think this worked. Yeah, I actually do. Or else it would keep getting worse. Right, right. So yeah, if you're not seeing those uh, 
rolls, uh, slugs. He's already done the trick. I won't worry too much about it. Uh, would you please help me with this ginkgo tree my husband gave me? We've had it for three or four years. It doesn't look happy now and did the same thing last year. It has mm -hmm. had plenty of water, sun, and I like this one, love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the leaves turn yellow and start falling mm -hmm. off in June. One lower limb died and I removed it. Please help me save my tree. I love your show. Thank you, Ms. Phyllis. <laughs> we appreciate that. And we're going to try to help save your tree. So... What did we think about that, though? We thought a couple of different things yeah, you know, after we, looking at that picture. I think picture. there's several things yeah. probably going on. And when when I get like a question like that, you, you kind of try to read a little bit between the lines. Mm -hmm. And this was a gift from her husband. Is right. that what I got correct. from it? This is correct. So okay. she's probably trying to take really, really good care. Oh, yeah. And yes. sometimes that's sometimes we tend to overdo. And it could be that she's overwatering could some. That you know that maybe then ginkgos don't like wet feet as right. we talked That's about. Right. They right. like well-drained soil. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if a plant is not doing well, and the canopy doesn't look well, you really want to look at the roots. Uh -huh. That's, That's where probably the problem is. If you know there's been no chemicals, you know there's not a mechanical thing. You look at those roots. Watering will tend to kill roots if it's too much water. Right. And when we looked at the base of that plant, it looked like that there were some roots exposed. Mm -hmm. And it looked like some of them may were tended to curl, curl around. Uh -huh. So it may be that, number one, it's not planted deep enough. Right, which and, is what I, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, because, and there's mulch around it. So you pull the mulch, mulch back, there's still going to be roots exposed. So she needs to probably look at that. Okay. And then to also pull the, pull the mulch back, pull the soil back, and see if there are any circling or girdling roots. Mm -hmm. Because if that plant was held for several years in a container in a nursery, as we all know, plants, the roots tend to girdle <laughs> yes, or circle do. around the pot. And if you don't tease those out when you plant it, they will continue to want to girdle and go in, in the same. circle right. instead of going out into the existing soil and setting down a really, really good root and system. And I can actually see that too, because mm -hmm. look, it's only been three or four years. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a young tree. Right. Right. That's probably been sitting yeah. in the nursery. Yeah. So yeah. I would look at that root system and, and it's what she should do if that is a problem. Right. You know, she should pull that plant out of the ground and pull those roots apart and then plant it back at the right depth. And because she's doing that now in the heat of the summer, she really needs to stay on top of, you know, taking care of that sure. plant and not letting it dry out. But yeah. don't overwater. Don't just saturate it on a time schedule, do it as the plant needs it. Okay. You know, and a lot of people say, That's oh, right. I got to water it, so it's been a week, so I need water. Well, some plants don't need water in every week, especially right. if it rains. Right. So, and ginkgos are very, very mm -hmm. slow growing. Yes, you know? they are. Yeah. Very slow. Yeah. Okay. All right. They're an interesting plant, yeah. too, so. Right. Yeah, we wish, you know, wish her much success. Yeah. Uh, Walt, anything you want to add to that? No, I think uh, everything is pretty much spot on. I did have a question to ask Dr. Kelly about it also. When you see the roots are all bound in a pot, is it okay to cut some of those roots yeah, off? Okay, it, it I, is. I, I thought. Yeah, okay. it is. And and if you d do that a lot, I mean, if you if you got big old roots, try to unwind the bigger roots, and you can prune those back. Okay. Try not to prune any of the like we talked about the feeder, the feeder roots. roots. Okay. And if you do do a lot of extensive pruning on the roots, it might not be a bad idea to prune that canopy back some so that the root system is more in balance with the canopy. Yes. Okay, makes yeah. sense. I saw landscapers power washing crepe myrtle trees last summer to remove scale. Is this a good way to treat crepe myrtle scale? Does it do any harm to the plants? And this is from Tom and Bartlett. So they're out there power washing the crepe myrtles to knock off the crepe myrtle bark scale which is a recommendation. What do you think about that? Will it harm the tree? That depends on the power washer. That depends on the got. power washer. You know, if you're yeah. just washing it off, scrubbing it off, right. and it's not tearing into the bark of the plant, you're, it's, it's probably a good thing. But right. I've seen power washers that could, could, could just about eat concrete. And, <laughs> and, uh, if it's stripping the bark, if it's da damage to the bark, then don't do it. Right. It depends on your power washer. Okay. Probably most power, and, and how close you are, yeah, how, how, how you, you handle are, your power yeah. washer. Okay, and the spray but, itself, yeah. if, you, if you're doing like a pinpoint spray, I mean, you can knock off some bark. You can prune with it. 
Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> right. Pinpoint. It's not there. My goodness. Ball. But you know, uh, Dr. Frank Hale, and you know Dr. Hale, mm -hmm. uh, our etymologist uh, for extension, talks about using an angled 15% fan spray. Okay, mm -hmm. and he said that will actually do some good. Angled 15% fan spray would actually do so some good. So that's why you're not pointing directly at it. Yeah, you're not pointing you yeah, directly at it, right. But yeah, you're right. If pinpoint yeah. spray or something like that, especially close, yeah, wouldn't. <laughs> Man, you'll blow bark off the tree. I mean, you know, my ATV, the four-wheeler, they don't recommend <laughs> washing with a power washer because it'll take the paint off. Wow, okay. So, you know. So there you have it, right? <laughs> you know, it, just, it, depends on your, it depends on your power washer. Why didn't my Columbine and Virginia bluebells bloom this spring? There are hydrangeas in the same garden bed that bloomed well. And this is from Miss Jean in Brighton. So why didn't my Columbine and Virginia yeah, bluebells I, well, bloom? I thought about that a great deal. And, and we don't know. Can, no, we, we, we don't, don't know. We don't really know cultural problems right. or if the conditions have changed right. in the bed from year to year. But my assumption is that they apparently maybe have bloomed in the past. I'm not sure. Or either she just seeded those. And if she had just seeded those or just transplanted and used them as transplants this spring, they typically do not bloom the first mm -hmm. year. Columbines or Virginia bluebells. And particularly Virginia bluebells. Okay. If you set those out. Or as small transplants, it can take them several years to settle in and you get good flowers. And they're ephemerals. Virginia oh. bluebell is an ephemeral. It's a spring ephemeral, which means, well, like this time of year, it's already gone dormant. Sure. Like trilliums, you know, and right. our other spring ephemerals. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's probably due to not knowing exactly, I would guess, they just weren't old enough. Okay. That they were younger plants and tell her not to despair that probably they will flower really well next year. But now they need uh, Virginia bluebells. The place I have seen them uh, growing out in nature is at the Sipsi Bankhead National Forest over here in North Alabama. Mm. And they were on a sandy floodplain oh, of a creek. So they gotta have good so drainage. So they like really well drained oh. soil and they do like spring rains though. And, but they need it draining well oh. and consistent moisture to do well. And if they like the place, they will reseed and spread. And columbines, the thing about columbines, they're short-lived perennials. Okay. You can do really well with them for a few years, and if you don't let them go to seed, and I know the new hybrids, they, they will set seed probably, but they mm. won't be true to type, which is fine. You know, I let them do that, and they'll come back every year from seed. So you've got older plants and younger plants if she lets them go back to seed, see. Okay. So sometimes it takes a few years for those columbines that are young to get established into flower well. And they do need some partial shade, obviously. Okay. Yeah, I was about to ask you, yeah. what are the best conditions yeah, for Yeah, they don't columbine. need hot afternoon sun for sure. Okay. You know, they need filtered shade from like high canopied, you know, deciduous trees. Okay. Like they'd be in the woods. Okay. Yeah. There you have it, Miss Jean. All right. My peonies have a powdery look with black spots covering the leaves. Can you tell me what is the problem, what is causing this problem, and what to use to get rid of the problem before they die? And this is Benny in Mumford. So we have powdery look on the, our peonies to have black spots. So what's causing the problem? Well, I would say that it's something that started probably in the spring. Mm -hmm. And if she's going to prevent it next spring, she mm -hmm. needs to probably spray with a broad spectrum fungicide mm -hmm. like daconil, mm -hmm. chlorothalonil. But right now, I wouldn't worry about the foliage <laughs> on the peony. You know, I really wouldn't because it's not putting out any new foliage. The damage has been done. It's already done. So I just let it go. And when that, when that foliage gets killed by a frost, clean it up, take it away, burn it up, get it off the property. <laughs> and then as soon as you see it emerging in the spring with that foliage, she needs to start spraying with a preventive fungicide, right. something like, you know, chlorothalonil, yeah, I would think. Chlorothalonil is yeah. good. Again, you can go with yeah. a copper-based yeah, yeah, yeah. fungicide. Yeah, that's right, man, because they have. Sulfur is something else you can use as well. But yeah, this time of year, you know, people get upset when they've got bad foliage on things. And if it's something that's herbaceous, like mm -hmm. a peony, mm -hmm. that's going to get zonked out here in a couple of months anyway, just don't worry about it. She could even cut the foliage down. It probably wouldn't hurt the plant. Get rid of it oh, if it okay. bothers her. Oh, yeah, okay. she yeah, sure know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So practice good sanitation. Yep. Yeah, make sure you get that up because they do yep. contain spores. 
Yep. Right? Yep. So, oh, yeah. yeah. When it yeah. starts raining, starts to get windy, yeah. Yeah. Those things can be all over the place. Yeah, Anything my you peony add? looks really bad oh. now, too. So. Okay, so yours, okay. Yeah, long, long, long. I just don't look at it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just just right. go somewhere else. Because the damage is done. It's you already done. You can't cure it. Yeah, right. just, just know to take care of it next spring and clear up that, take care of the old foliage just fall, clean it up, okay. get rid of it. Yeah. All right. There you have it. We appreciate the question. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on questions we answered this week, go to familyplotsgarden.com. We have all of today's questions listed at the top of the home page. Thanks for watching and keep sending in the questions. It keeps us on our toes. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.